Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Wolf. Um, I represent Samada. Um, my background is an uh, economist, and uh, I teach law as a Goldman for a while in London and crevasse in New York. And now I'm running Samada. So I'm for this panel, I'm the uh, sort of oddball out uh, startup. Uh, this is a regulatory panel. Um, I want to give just a few perspectives on what um, we at Samada think about decentralized future and exercising in personam jurisdiction. So governance is a big ticket um, item for the uh, blockchain evolution. And um, so I want to give just a very quick five minute overview on um, comparative governance protocols and what people are doing in this space to deal with governance and talk very briefly about a block, a protocol evolution and then our perspectives on this. So um, if you, folks in the, in the industry, you all know that the industry isn't perfect. We have huge problems. It's a nascent industry. Um, and so there are, uh, there are multiple issues that have been addressed. So scaling is one uh, where we have actually in America one of the most promising startups with EOS and several others. Um, but governance is one thing that uh, continuously uh, creates concerns in the industry. Yeah? Um, so if we look at and compare this, I would argue um, that uh, governance and legal certainty is one of the main uh, blockers slash stoppers for the DLT evolution. Um, again, scalability has been addressed. Governance here um, is uh, second to last on the, on the bottom, and then legal certainty. Um, the panel, we, we just talked about this very briefly. Um, if we compare a traditional internet transaction, which is a centralized transaction, with um, a uh, crypto transaction, smart contract transaction, there, there are key differences. One, of course, is the lacking tra tra um, uh, traceability of these transactions. So um, if we, and we can debate this, and I'm happy to debate this with our litigators, um, but uh, in a traditional internet transaction, we know who the counterparties are, we can trace the payment details, and traditional legal remedies apply. In a crypto transaction, I'm not so sure if the traditional uh, remedies actually apply. So for instance, um, if we cannot trace these transactions, and we can debate how, how, how far we can trace it, so I would argue with a Monero or Zcash transaction, it is nearly impossible practically. Now, there will be some uh, uh, panelists who will argue that the courts will sufficiently allocate uh, funding towards tracing those parties um, if the stakes are high enough, and we can debate that. I think even, even if you have the uh, sufficient funding, I think there are huge problems in exercising in personam jurisdiction across the board. So then the question becomes, if, the, if there is a level of incompatibility with the existing legal infrastructure, the question then becomes, how are we going to deal with that? Now, our answer at Samada would be that uh, we need a uh, intra-crypto legal solution. And that's what we're, we're working on. That's where this whole uh, protocol started. And I'll end here. Um, so we, we look at this as reputation verification in decentralized autonomous systems that are civil attack resistant. Um, that's what we believe can be turned into a precedent setting system uh, on the Samada platform. And I, I'm sparing you all the technical details. Just this as a last one. But the idea of the precedent here is if you compare the left with the right, to the extent that people are using protocols on the Samada platform um, and are citing those, you can see the levels are going up. Um, we, will, we, we have an incentivizing system that allows those precedents that are set up in decentralized systems to receive additional uh, reputation remuneration. And I know this is too technical, and I'll shut up now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's many in the audience have a feeling that there is something big fundamental happened, but few people probably catch. Uh, guys, who can kind of make a practical insights out of this? Well, and also elaborate this topic, how technology can help to achieve goals of regulation. Yeah? Wolf and I were talking before. And, hi, my name is Brian Klein. I'm a litigator in the space. I represent a lot of the leading companies and entrepreneurs in various litigation, like um, the Brightmans and DLS and their class action uh, related to the Tezos fundraiser. Um, so what we talked about this before. I, I, I will agree that governance is important, and the regulatory uncertainty is a real problem in the industry. But I do think that the courts, as a litigator, I know, and as a former federal prosecutor, the courts and the government are able to track down people. What am I doing? Um, or they will spend the resources to do so if the dollar amounts are high enough. 
So I think for and, and very then, small, smart contract transactions, just like you don't sue somebody over a grocery store bill, um, you know, that's not going to be an issue. But in terms of being able to put someone in court and find the party, I think that is um, going to happen for bigger things. And I think the reason why is, one, there's an incentive because of the economics. But two is, you know, people who deal with these contracts ultimately do want to usually to cash out for fiat, and they have to use an off-ramp or on-ramp to do so, like an exchange or some sort of third party. So the approach here would not be to reverse engineer the hashing. It would be external uh, log-on points that would be used to identify the trunk. Yeah, the you, would, yeah. you would have financial surveillance, which is how it's done now. That's how FinCEN operates. That's how all these organizations operate with cash. Think about cash. People move cash around all the time, but there are certain reporting transactions when you go to a bank or another money service business, and that's how the government surveils. And um, so I think you raise a good point, and I, you know, I haven't looked in your product enough. I'm sure it's interesting and worthwhile, definitely, but um, I think there is a way for that to happen. But then we're also dealing with regulatory arbitrage. Yes, regulatory arbitrage is a huge problem in the industry, and it goes to, I think, the Dinah's point now about ICOs. Um, sure. Who has the clicker? And I apologize up front. I have to catch a plane. So and you're, you're a technology guy, so what do I, what do I do? Green is forward, red is backward. Green is, <laughs> thank you. Um, hi, I want to introduce myself. My name is uh, Dina Ellis Rockhind. I work at Paul Hastings, and I know everyone really doesn't like lawyers, but I'm actually worse than a lawyer. I am a lobbyist, so many of you may, from the US will understand this, will consider me a swamp creature. I'm going to talk mostly today about what's going on in the House and Senate and Capitol Hill, but I want to speak real, real quick about what, a little bit about my, what's going on at the SEC. Um, and I just want to say the, both Capitol Hill and the agencies are very interconnected. Most people don't understand that, that the SEC is very influenced by what lawmakers are saying and doing on the Hill and vice versa. A lot of times the SEC wants cover from the Hill, or the Hill cover wants cover from the SEC. And the other interconnection is that many of the staffers and the leadership over at the SEC come from Capitol Hill. So three of my former colleagues actually um, sit, um, are, are, chair, are commissioners at the, at the SEC. Um, just a few comments about the SEC real quick. Generally speaking, even though it doesn't seem this way, um, the commissioners are um, very receptive of ICOs and blockchain at the SEC. I know it doesn't feel that way. Um, Jay Clayton, I think his biggest worry is that he sees retail investors, uh, millennials, getting ripped off and he gets hauled up to Capitol Hill trying to explain himself for why didn't he do anything. Um, I, I agree that most ICOs are really securities, 99% of them. I have all kinds that come to me. Some are you know, blockchain based, but some of them are just somebody who's doing real estate investing and needs investors. Um, but there are those few, um, there are some animals that are different like Ether, Ripple and some others that aren't, you know, that are a little bit different. Um, and those types of players need to be not only talking to the career staff at the SEC, but may need to talk to the leadership at Cap on um, at the SEC, the commissioners and their staff, as well as Capitol Hill. On Ether, I just want to say it's, it's kind of a big deal and not such a big deal. The big thing is it's the first time the SEC has admitted that something can convert from a security into something else. I've always learned in law school, once a security, always a security. So it is a, a change in some mindset. But the other part of it is it is also a pragmatic decision because there are tons, and we're not talking about the people that originally issued um, Ether or the people who privately bought shares of Ether, but we're talking about tons of millennials or people like me that bought Ether thinking that it was going to increase in value. And if, you would have, if it would have been labeled a security, there would have been lots of retail investors um, that were left holding the bag and had nothing. Last thing I want to say about the SEC is that not all exchanges are created equal. And if you are trading securities, which most of these things are, except for those odd ducks or new ducks, I would say, um, uh, that you have to be either trading on an alternative trading system or an, um, a national exchange. And most of the exchanges don't have the registrations um, with the SEC and with FINRA to be operating as an exchange, and you're not protected as a retail 
um, consumer. Um, I happen to represent one that is registered. It's called Templum. So let me move to my sides, and I'm going to go I, very. I, I got to jump in though, because I just because I can't let it pass. I fundamentally disagree that 99% of these or whatever are securities. I think that's a complete failure to understand the tokens, the technology, and to understand the Howey test. And I think that the mindset, and I regularly deal with the SEC enforcement attorney. I represent a lot of the major players in front of the SEC. I think that there is a real education process here. I think there is a very compelling case that many of these aren't securities. I think that there is a lot of overreach right now. Yeah, and let me jump in on that. If, you're, if, there, if there really is something different and there is overreach, which I haven't seen super unique things, that most of these things are startups, um, if there is something really unique, you need to be talking to the head of Corpfin and probably going in and talking to the staff and the commissioners themselves and educating them. If you look at Hester Pierce's speech that she made about a month ago or so, she actually says, please come in and talk to me and talk to Corp Finn. Let me run through my but slides I, really problem, quickly. I want to run through. I just want to jump in on that. The problem with that approach is most of my clients got subpoenas before they had a chance to talk to them. And I think there is a real disconnect between different sides of the house. Yeah, and we have clients that are like that at my firm, and what we do is we deal with the mess that they're in, but we also start talking at the higher levels with the SEC and with players on Capitol Hill. So let me run through my slides very, very quickly. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so my first um, slide here, um, this is really about the Jobs Act. So when I was in the Senate, um, I was the lead author of most of the Jobs Act, Reg A+, 506C, um, emerging growth companies, eliminating the ban on solicitation. And your question to be, you know, why am I talking about the Jobs Act? Because most of the folks in the ICO space, they either lobbied for the Jobs Act, they grew out of the Jobs Act, and their, their business models are based off of the Jobs Act. Um, real quick, so again, um, the reason the Jobs Act is so related is because most of these are, and I know you're gonna to wanna to jump in, but most of these are really <coughs> private placements. And the Jobs Act really just scratched the surface of reforming our securities laws that are still rooted in the 1933 and 34 Act. So this real pent up demand to modernize the laws to um, keep pace with um, the fact that we have the internet and now we have blockchain. There's really a significant opportunity out there to make changes on Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill really wants to do more to loosen up the securities laws and modernize them. And so we've had a few examples recently. One is the omnibus had some provisions on BDC. We just had the Dodd-Frank you know, reg relief bill. There's actually a title in there um, on reg relief that's on capital formation. It's Title V. The most significant thing is Reg A, um, fully reporting companies can become Reg A plus companies. And you also have an effort um, on the House side. Um, the House was promised it would do more on doing some more capital formation bills. I'm not going to, I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm not going to say too much. You might want to take pictures of this. Um, but these are just some of the specifics that were in the bank reg relief bill. Um, and then on the House side, um, some of the bills they've been passing. They're actually marking up some more bills that loosen up capital formation this week. Um, I don't see there being another um, piece of legislation on capital formation. I may be wrong, but I do think to the extent that these things that loosen up securities laws are bipartisan, um, they will probably move and must pass legislation like an, um, either spending bills or flood insurance or something else like that. And I'm almost done my slide, this is my last slide. So these are my takeaways um, in terms of Capitol Hill, which not a lot of people talk about. First of all, as I said, we're loosening up our securities laws in a disorganized way on, on Capitol Hill. You're likely to see more loosening up of the securities laws. I know not as fast as this audience would like. If it were up to me, we would really overhaul the whole entire, you know, um, the, you know we would really reform the 33, 34, 40 Act. Um, I don't think you're likely to see legislation um, specifically on cryptocurrency or blockchain uh, or ICOs, but there are a couple players who have been interested. Um, you've got a congressman from Ohio who, who's working on something, and Carolyn Maloney ha from New York has legislation that de defines when something's a security and when it's not. Um, where you're going to really see most of the action is there is a ton of movement on money laundering legislation. And there hasn't been new money laundering legislation since the Patriot Act, Right Act, their 9-11. So in the House, um, you have a hearing this week on cryptocurrency and illicit finance. 
In the Senate, you have a hearing on money laundering. Um, you have another hearing with Jay Clayton in the House this week. And there really is a plan to get money laundering legislation done this year by the year end. I believe that cryptocurrency, ICO, et cetera, will get rolled in. Some provisions will get rolled into that uh, money laundering legislation. And my takeaway is you really can't fight against that. You are not going to win um, and, and being opposed to everything. So what I, you know, my recommendation is that those who want to, you know, operate in the U.S. and stay above the law really need to engage with, you know, policymakers on the Hill and in Treasury and the other agencies. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I guess I will speak next. Uh, my name is Michael Golomb. Uh, my background, I actually work at companies. Uh, so I've taken two companies public, one as a CFO, one back in 2000 in New York Stock Exchange, $800 million IPO, security company, Tim Draper's company then in 2006 in London Stock Exchange, $2 billion IPO. Then I, I was the founding CFO at Bitfury, started a company here in San Francisco. We built the company. Then uh, right now currently a CFO public trade company in New York. So I personally raised uh, four companies, uh, billions of dollars, both equity, debt, myself. So working with investment bankers, lawyers, uh, with friends here, and also inside. So I'll speak myself, and currently working with MECO, an ICO governance foundation. So when I will speak not about um, what the difference between uh, equity, uh, you know, security tokens or, or uh, utility tokens, but I will say what, what investors really want to see. What will separate your um, investment thesis from others? So, first of all, nothing is new. If you want to have a real, um, real product, you, you really need to have corporate governance, real board of directors, real independent board members, real audit committee. If you're going to have um, use of proceeds or have escrow agents to have those proceeds separated, that will separate you from others, from the garbage that we see right now. This will, and then, for example, vesting of stock options for employees, board members, advisors, founders. This is what people want to see. This will separate you, everybody, from the garbage. And I, I'll jump in and I'll say, when regulators look at you, it also is very helpful because they recognize that you're running a, a legitimate business and you're not, you know, it lowers their radar that you might be a scam or Absolute, some other problem. Absolutely. Those Absolute. are like reasonable steps to take. I've been, a, I've been in, a, in blockchain space, or at that time it was Bitcoin space, 2012, 2013. I have not joined yet one company to be advisor, formal. I've been approached every day to be advisor. I have not joined yet because I, for me, these are the compliance. I'm a CPA, Stanford Business Grant. I have not joined one yet. Because for me, this is the number one. User proceeds, I want to see below. I'm in the normal company's board, board directors, audit committee member. For me, this is number one compliance. And yes, I was born in former Soviet Union. So uh, I'm proud of it. But I'm a US citizen. So uh, for me, this is important. This is, will separate you. And if you put this in your smart contract, this will separate you from 99% of all the garbage outside. So, um, uh, with Miko and I started uh, uh, ICO Governance Foundation, look it up, icogovernance.org, and you will see the items that this, this is, this, you've put those six, 14, 16 items in your smart contract. This will separate you from others. There's also <laughs> our friend Ryan who started Missouri companies, like Edgar, for our industry. If you use that kind of approach, the compliance. After you do your ICO or you do fundraising and you, file the, you follow this transparency with your investors for afterwards, this will also separate you from everybody else. This is normal process when you do fundraising. What, 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 why should you be different in this new world? Forget about all the stuff right now that we, you know, everybody, you know, utility token, security token, that's all great. You just need to follow normal process and fundraising. And if you're transparent in your investor relations with your investors, you will raise more and more and more. And that's just how it works. I mean, I just wanted to say that. And then um, just, just a couple of points. And um, I think that that's just what I brought to Welcome. Uh, I'm Giovanni Saletti. I'm a, a broker dealer, registered agent uh, with IAG. We're uh, an investment bank boutique with uh, 100 uh, 
professionals around the world. We have offices here in San Francisco, New York, um, Berlin, Singapore, um, Shanghai, and um, I'm also the compliance officer of a, uh, a, it started as a crowd financing platform in, uh, in Miami called Series One, and now pivoted to ICOs. And so what we do is actually what Dina explained, all those laws, uh, we consider, as Jay Clinton said, I mean, the majority of, of uh, securities, even if they're debatable, but in order to be on the safe side, if somebody comes up to us, let's consider it a security, and it's treated as security, and if we raise money in the US, we run, it's a private placement, so we probably, you know, we look at what they want to do, um, and then we say, hey, look, uh, most likely you, it's the best thing is to do a Reg D 506C, if you want to raise money from outside of the United States, a Reg S, but that's not enough because that covers us in the US. Now, if we go to Singapore, we also need to make sure that we, um, we're compliant with the Singaporeans. So with our offices, we help the, the company to raise money to be on the safe side from a legal point of view. Um, being bankers, uh, we don't do a lot of uh, retail. We just go to the institutions and try to get through the institutions the money. So the way we look at it is it's, um, it's an ICO. It's kind of a mini IPO. Um, I've been in merchants and acquisition for a long time. Um, there are kind of you know, levels of fundraising and exits. Uh, the investment bank boutiques like ours, they're kind of the transactions somewhere between 10 and 200 million, 250 million. From there on, you're fighting against the big banks, right? For well, see, ICO, it's the same thing. It's, an average ICO right now is 15 million, 20 million, 50 million. <coughs> so that's something no big bank will do because it's just too small. Uh, you'll have to go to the broker dealers, and we're one that has an international reach. And we're registered, and uh, through the crowdfunding platform that we use, being the, the compliance officer, we started with crowd financing, so a lot of that stuff is in there. Something that nobody tells you, everybody speaks about KYC and AML, um, but one thing that FINRA is telling us is that you need to educate the <coughs> users and investors because everyone is afraid. So what does that mean? When you go to any of the 41 registered crowd financing platforms, you will see that there is a lot of, there's a page with FAQs. When you sign up, you have to go through a process, and at the end they tell you, hey, have you read all the things that you got here? You have to know. So if you run an ICO and somebody is offering you to do that, the platform, if you don't have all that, it's probably not going to be compliant with the SEC and FINRA. They will have an issue. Um, so that's what we do. So what, what uh, Dina explained, we apply that. And what he just said, um, that's where I see also the future, the governance. So, so with the small token, you get to invest <coughs> much nearer to the, to the company. All those things, those, those, they're in the smart contract. And I'm going to go even further. So if somebody comes to me and say, my partner comes from the VC world, so why not go to a VC? Well, with ICOs, we do international stuff. So, and I know from Jay Clayton, he, he is pro ICOs. He says, I, I would like to, that a company in the Midwest has the, the same possibilities to raise money as a company in New York or in the Silicon Valley. Um, so we, we look at the company and then we say, look, um, instead of giving away to equity token, um, that's where the financial engineering is going to come in. You give some equity, some revenue in the first years, eh, and even maybe a call option if you do an, IC, an IPO one day, whatever it is. So I believe in the future, the governance is going to be part of the token and financial engineering, which you know will allow you to uh, um, dilute less or have a better leverage, or whatever. What do you think? I'm curious because. To me, there's a disconnect in the sense which is ICOs are a global phenomenon, and the U.S. has a very elastic definition of security under the Howey test that's applied in courts or by the SEC. But then you look globally, and it's a very narrow definition in most countries, you know, a very, very narrow definition. Like, you have to meet certain specific things, otherwise you're not a security. Like, what do you see, because I see this risk, and Wolf's gone, but of regulatory arbitrage, which is the U.S. is being potentially locked out of, because capital is going to take forever to do anything, we all know that, and it's going to be too little too late in terms of, or effective. Um, 
and the regulators are trying to enforce things through you know, actions now, court actions. But what do you see happening globally? Like, I mean, why would you even want to subject yourself to the U.S. regulatory regime? Because it's the biggest financial market. Yeah, and we have the, the most, most deepest, most, yeah, we have the deepest, and, most liquid capital markets in yeah. the world. But and, I, I think that's changing, though. If you it, look at the ICO proceeds, a lot of them are from abroad. I mean, these are global phenomenons. We traditionally have had those. Access. Right, right now, but if you, as I said, my partner coming from the uh, corporate venture, he's telling me they're all waiting on the sidelines to invest. Uh, and in the moment everything is clear and you know there's no risk that you get uh, sued, we will have all VCs and funds, everybody that we have here in the well, U.S. are going to sue. I'm a lawyer. Them. There's never going to be no risk someone's going to sue. I know. So that's how I <laughs> 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 I know. But, so if you're but, waiting for that, you might as well just wait forever. But, but I know, I know. But there's, there's a lot of money just waiting to be deployed. So but are we going to miss out, though? That's what I'm saying. My point is, and I know people aren't always conservative. Tim Draper is invested. He's a holder of um, DLS. And this is all public. You know, I mean, there are some very aggressive venture capitalists. There are some you know, Anderson, Andreessen Horowitz. I mean, it seems like people who are being too conservative might be missing out and losing out, and that could be the U.S. too. Well, you know, again, the, uh, if you talk to a corporate venture, the biggest fear is reputational risk. Yeah. So then I gotta invest 10 million here and lose on the stock market. Uh, you know, it's just- But those people would have never gotten into this space. I mean, those people, Traditional well, corporations weren't. No, I mean, funds, where you started funds, out. Funds cannot invest because they have because of because of their LPs can are not yes. allowing them to invest. We know that, right? Plus, uh, hedge funds can invest up to 150 million dollars. Yes. Based on their specific laws. So we, there's you know there's special laws, but on the other hand, why would we, if we are risking with the founders, why would we? Why would I want to invest in a utility token personally? I would rather invest in equity. Well, I think we all wish we'd invested more in the in Ether when it did its pre-sale, right? Okay, I think yeah. we can all agree there, and that yeah. was incredibly risky yeah. and crazy. I mean, I'm just saying, like, and I'm not advocating one position or the other. I think, you know, I, people come to me, I say, go talk to lawyers who will advise you what the laws are in our country or whatever country. I'm just saying, I feel like we're at a real risk here by trying to put square pegs in round holes, and we're missing out on what's happening abroad. You know, I, I just genuinely feel that's a real risk. See, and I think, I think the U.S. is just proceeding very carefully and are, is going to continue to provide clarity over time, but doesn't want to see a lot of retail investors losing a lot of money, nor, and it's also very concerned about national security and money laundering concerns. So I think over time the U.S. is going to provide clarity and that you have a, that um, officials within the Treasury and within the agencies are very open to these concepts, but that there's a disconnect, particularly between the further west you go in the US, there's a dis disconnect by those who are in the industry and what's going on in Washington, DC. Yeah, and I think Washington, DC has proven time and time again to be behind the times. And I think this idea that we need to protect retail investors, I agree that's important. But all these projects, they're not retail investors in that sense. People know these things are risky. No one's sending ether for an ERC-20 token, an ICO, and not thinking that's risky. Okay. Even if, to even know how to do that, okay. you have so, to be a very sophisticated but, okay, individual. So, so what happened in 2001, when uh, our grandparents put money, 401k money, and the dot-com stopped, the music stopped, what happened, who, who lost the money? I mean, look, there's a risk when you invest in anything, uh, the stock market. Our grandparents market. lost money, and they lost their savings, yeah. and then yeah. people <clears> in, the <throat> in the middle of America who actually didn't know, were not professional investors, they, they could not take the money out, and they but, lost but, all their savings. Our, they lost their mortgages, their houses, and everything but else. But no one's taking that money, and no grandmothers are out there, knock on wood. Really? It's, millen it's millennials. They're, base, they're putting their money right now. It's millennials. Make, make, it's baby boomers' make, children who are putting a lot of money into this stuff. They're putting their money in, 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 in the ICO, ICO that, market. That's not who's when investing. When I'm driving an Uber, and the guy is asking me, where should he invest? Come on. You know, no, I, I'm not saying that it's, it hasn't reached some sort of mainstream knowledge, and people aren't, but... It's like anything. We all thought the world was safe and secure, and then 2008 and 9, and everything blew up. We thought we have all these regulations that were supposed to protect us from Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Those all failed. So the idea that somehow something from DC is going to make us all safe from unfair losses is just not founded in reality. No, there's always going to be fraud. And if it, you know, if it were up to me, 
There's you know, fraud today. There's, there's been, always going to be fraud. fraud. There's always going to be fraud. There's always going to be greed. But, yeah, but if, it it were, if it were up to me, we would get rid of the accredited investor standard, and we would, you know, we let people gamble, and we would make it easier for retail investors to invest in private securities. But that's not the law as it is today. I agree with you on that. I'm glad we found something to agree but, on, which is the I, democratization. I, I believe there's of, another thing. I, was, I, I wrote most of the jobs, Act. We were loosening up securities laws. Uh, Another way this whole thing will correct itself is uh, through the broker dealers and the people who work in the field because me and other colleagues of mine, we don't pick up uh, white paper companies anymore. We want, I mean, an ICO, I believe, is going to be an additional uh, tool that is parallel to a Series A or Series B. Uh, if, if, if somebody comes to me with, that is, you know, with an idea which is, I, I don't understand it or it's not really viable, I'm not even going to support it. I'm not going to go to investors. But you would have rejected all the good ideas. I mean, no offense to the traditionalists who are broker dealers and say, you know what, my established network should be the one you should go through. It makes sense to me on some level. But all these ideas that got us here would have been rejected by everybody that you're talking about. Coinbase, Ethereum, all these ideas of why we're here and why this is even a phenomenon would have been rejected out of the gate. So and, so, I and so I think it's not fair now to say, oh, well, now we have some winners, and now we need to funnel everybody through this old system, which, guess what, we're all a part of and we're all going to make money on, when the whole point of all this stuff is to, in my opinion, overthrow what's failed everybody, which is the traditional financial institution system. So the I, big banks, the big brokerage funds, the big investment bankers, they've failed people can continuously. I, can I, I respectfully disagree with you because I was there at the beginning and I, if it, are you trying I to know you were. Sell, yeah, yeah. sell me on this? No, I, I actually support that. <laughs> me too. What we're talking about is protecting retail investors. What, that's what we're talking about. Create, uh, because some, that's why there be, we have a venture capitalists or people, not, or people or, or angel investors who invest in those kind of, they have appetite for that risk. But so why protect, can't retail investors enjoy the upside? Well, I was going to say there's two approaches to this, okay? There's one approach, which is called the California way, which means you're like Uber and you just go as fast as you can and you hope you're okay. And then the other approach is you follow the law and, or, you know, I'm the kind of person where I say, what, where can the laws go? Or you look at changing the laws or changing the regulations. Then there's the Wyoming way, I was just there two and weeks Arizona, ago, yes. and they're trying to find their angle. I mean, I think I think it's not going to be the old the old banking system. It's going to kind of meet somewhere in the middle. The uh, innovative bankers they're going to embrace it and do something with it like we do, and then the, the hardcore, the old style, they're probably going to die away. And yeah. the the cowboy platforms and exchanges, they'll have to. You know, adapt some of the rules that protect investors, and um, you know, one one of the things that I struggle with VCs, we all know that you raise money to go through an angel fund and into Series A and B, and what is it? It's actually risk mitigation, right? So you say you better do that, get some money, you go to the next. So when when you do an ICO and you raise 10, 20, 50 million, what happened to all that? It's actually a recipe to fail. So, so you, you need some governance there. That thought that has that's risk of, you know, mitigation that, that you use in finance is gone in ICOs, and somehow that needs to come in. So I think there's a lot of things. Well, there are a number of responsible ICOs. I mean, I'll admit there are some ICOs out there that raise a lot of red flags, and then there are some that have been done sort of pushing forward that you know, are responsible, are done for the right reason, are done are building legitimate teams and legitimate projects. I'm just saying I feel, as an American, I'm concerned that we're just two steps behind in our regulatory environment and that it's a real danger to us and that we're going to lose out. That's just my view. And dealing regularly with the SEC and regulators, there are a lot of genuine, smart people there. I deal with them every day who really are interested in the technology, will listen. But the problem is we have a system where Capitol Hill takes forever. We have mixed messages from different agencies, and we have a, a ton of regulatory uncertainty, and it's just it's a recipe for a lot of problems. It, I mean, it is true. I mean, I have companies coming up to me, American companies, they leave in the country. They go to Singapore, and I have, I'm originally from Europe, I have Europeans who said, no, you know what, we're not even going to touch the U.S. But I think that will change because we just have 
most of the money. So eventually, but for uh, now we do. For now, but yeah. I was going to say, yeah. I you know I've talked and I've spoken with Hester Pierce and some of the others at, at the SEC, and that's the last thing on their world they want. They do not want this to all leave the U.S. So at the end of the day, again, it's this lack of connection between the play, a lot of the players, and some of the leadership within the SEC, the CFTC, et cetera. I'd like to hear Mark, Mark hasn't, uh, sorry Mark to put you on the spot, but about DTCC, which plays an important role in all this. Yeah, so um, my name is Mark Weech, and I used to serve as a commissioner at the CFTC. When I was there, it was the time when the first Bitcoin derivative was approved. It was done through a self-executing uh, process, which probably no one in the world knew about before CME and SIBO went through the same process to list their uh, Bitcoin future. But, but in any case, when I was the acting chairman, that's when that first contract was, was approved. Um, and it was, it was done almost in the uh, quiet of night. There wasn't nearly as much attention paid to it at the time. That was back in 2014. Um, but I today serve as the head of the policy group at DTCC, which is part of the apparatus that exists today and has for some time and, and maybe is a, an apparatus that not everyone on the panel thinks has served the country's interests very well or the investing public very well, but um, and I don't necessarily take issue with that or argue with that, but I guess I was trying to think before the panel and, and just listening to the discussion what what sort of insight or interesting point to make in all of this, and, and there's a lot of them, I guess, that come to mind, but trying to focus on just a few. As a former policymaker, former regulator, and now someone um, outside of the regulatory community, and, and but nonetheless dealing with the regulatory community on a routine basis, I would say that um, I'm guessing no one would disagree with this in the panel. The policies in place here in the U.S. and generally familiar with similar ones outside the U.S., but most familiar with ones in the U.S. They're all put in place with the best intent of intentions, as, it, as, as I think probably most people would, would agree with. Um, you think about at a high level what drives the rules of the SEC or the CFTC, and it's things along the lines of uh, investor protection, putting in place disclosures to ensure investor protection, rules around making it difficult or trying to meet out manipulation of marketplaces, manip manipulative activity, uh, making sure there's rules around good stewardship of other people's money. So you think about custody requirements that uh, fall upon asset managing types of um, uh, institutions or even broker dealers. So all of those rules, again, are manifestations of ideas that are really not controversial at all. Now, it's a fair point to say that do they neatly apply to or best apply to uh, the world that's developing before our eyes and that we're all part of, which is a fascinating one. Um, those are great questions to ask, but I guess, again, the point I would make is that the rules are in place today in the traditional securities market, let's say, if we define it like that, uh, for very, very good reasons. And, and because of those rules, we have the hallmarks of the capital markets that we see here in the U.S. that were uh, referenced before. Does that mean that policy should not adopt and, and be a little bit more nimble and reacting to technology developments? Um, I think policymaking should do that. Um, it should be more nimble, but on the other hand, the, the manner in which legislation is created in the Congress, that was designed to be kind of complicated. It's a consensus organization. It's designed to only put something or a piece of legislation or a law in place if there's enough people in the United States that agree to it. So, but so doesn't that argue, I mean, look, sorry to interrupt, but I was Well, in, just, just to finish that last point, and then I'd love to hear your response. The fact of the matter is, most Americans aren't thinking about the crypto asset space, right? So that's part of the reason why you're not going to see any action on a Capitol Hill. Dean, I'm sure you've had these same conversations. If you talk to the staff and the members of Congress, the ones that are interested in it are interested in it for personal reasons, by and large. Mm -hmm. They think it's a fascinating space. They, they see some of the appeals. They see some of the efficiencies that can be brought uh, to, to capital raising through an ICO, for example. But 
very, very importantly, it's not because they have a constituent that's beating down their door saying, hey, we really need you, Mr. Congressman, to pay attention to this and to focus on this. That's, very, that's just not happening. And instead, the interest is driven by mostly personal interest and, and just trying to be responsible in their roles as, uh, as legislators. So uh, guys, let's why? sum up. It's good if we leave space for at least one commission promoters. Who wants to sum up before we come to Q&A? Michael. <laughs> All right, you have a mic. Okay, and we can ask questions. Questions. Okay. So governance questions, is important. <laughs> governance. That's your takeaway. Uh, government or <laughs> governance. <laughs> I was hoping that the Jobs Act would have opened the world to investment by small investors. I have a small company. I have many people from my small town, hometown who would like to give me $100 or 1000 The SEC castrated the Jobs Act. The ICO world, in my opinion, exists because there, is, there are many people who want to put $100, $1,000 into something and hope for appreciation. Uh, most of you, you guys over here talk about rich people making more money. Uh, for the income inequality, that's going to be existential. How do we bring blockchain technology and investing in this to the point to where there is enough trust? We talk about trusted actors. And you guys help build trust, lawyers, CFOs, people like that. How do we? Quit talking about all of the, the ways we can fail. How can we help make this a success so that my friends in a little town in Alabama can put $100 in it and hope to turn that into $1,000 or $10,000? I, I'd love to respond to that just quickly and love to hear what the others say. But um, you know, I mentioned the system by which laws and regulations are made. It's consensus driven. Um, one of, it's not a design flaw of the Constitution. Uh, or the Administrative Procedures Act. But one of the issues with having a representative government is that it can be reactionary. So and in, in, in what that a lot of times in practice means is that lawmakers, rule makers will come to action um, in response to extreme events. And I say, and this is relevant to your question because I think because of the points that you made and, and, and for reasons why we're on this panel talking largely about ICOs, it's a, question, a good question as to whether the dials have been turned too far uh, towards protecting the investor. A couple of others have said that. Again, no one can argue with um, the, good, the good sense behind having rules to invest or to protect investors, but have we gone too far? Um, you made the point about allowing people to take risks. Some people understand the risk profile of an ICL and they want to invest in it anyway. Maybe they only want to put 100 bucks <coughs> in it. So should, shouldn't we think about whether to allow that? And, so I don't know what the, what the practical advice is because, as I said, no one's really beaten down the doors of, of Congress at the moment saying that we need to look at that question. Although Dina did say there's been some relax, relaxation of the securities law. Yeah, I mean, there have been sort of, and it's also very reactionary. So what happens is, you know, like Wegmans goes up there. People like Wegmans and they've got, you know, and they go up there and they say, okay, we want, um, we want to be able to give more shares to our employees and so you can, cha can you change this particular provision? There's not an effort underway. You know, if I were up on the Hill right now, and Mark and I both have worked on the Hill, he's a Democrat and I'm a Republican, and we're agreeing a lot here. So you see things do get got done. Um, if I were up on the Hill right now and was working for one of the key players, I would say, okay, let's get some smart people together and thinking about how do we reform the US securities laws. The other issue is that in this space, you've got a lot of entrepreneurs that, you know, maybe. Um, don't have the resources to really come to Washington and spend that time talking to the key players or they don't know how it works. And um, that, I mean, I would say, you know, in Jobs Act, um, there were coalitions for, part, you know, that was a part of developing for different parts of the bills. Um, but part of the reason why Title III, um, I would say, doesn't work as well as it should was because you really didn't have an organized effort um, up on Capitol Hill. And in in also in the, in the past, you, you were supposed, when you have a public company, you're supposed to have three years of financials and two years of balance sheet. With the Jab Act, you only need two years. So, so right now, blockchain companies are exploring ideas of doing reverse merger into public entities, where you can actually do that right now. 
and not with the history, because there's, there's not a lot of companies in the blockchain or DLT this area that have a lot of history. So now you can actually do reverse merger using folks like from investment banking and, and uh, lawyer attorneys to can help in, in, in the, instead of doing ICO, actually do reverse merger into the public entities on public markets. Right now, people do in Canada, but it's, it's outside of Job uh, Act, but actually New York Stock Exchange and things like that, and, and, and alternative exchanges and go through the process. So that's how you can potentially invest into those entities and make money there. I, I, think, some things like I, I think you you're right, you're identifying the right issue, sir, which is you've been fundamentally let down by the government and the regulators, and this is not intentionally maybe, but the dial is turned too far. And there's not going to be an easy solution. And frankly, I think it's just going to be everyone stuck with a system. What's not identified, I think, is that traditional players want to keep the moat that has they have around them, you know, because they want to maintain their profits. Yeah, and so that's why these there are good intentions behind these laws, and they do protect people, but you know, they don't want to change. And the ICO market and this blockchain space, and those are people working from outside the system that want to change things. And the idea that our economy should run through Washington, I think, is absurd. It should be the opposite. We should be allowing innovation to happen. I mean, if you look at what other countries are doing, responsible countries like England, they are not regulating through enforcement actions. They are waiting to see how things develop. They're allowing for sandboxes. They're doing all these sort of steps. And then they're going to come in and figure out what makes work, what makes sense.